Hello everybody, Noah here with Learn Meta Analysis. In this video, we are going to do an introduction to systematic review so we can really start to understand the different types and what they might be useful for. So as I was mentioning, we're gonna understand some key types of systematic and non-systematic reviews, start to analyze what some of the differences are between them. We're going to explain why systematic reviews are useful for researchers at various phases of their career. And last but not least, we're gonna identify the similarities and differences between scoping reviews, systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and umbrella reviews, because these are by far the most common that we see in education. All right, so this is a visual representation of a really abbreviated version of a taxonomy of reviews. So what I mean by this is at the top, you can see we have this really big umbrella of reviews. And over on the left, we can see that there are some that are non-systematic. This would be things like a narrative review or an overview paper. Meanwhile, on the other side, we have this uh, cluster called systematic reviews. And the confusing thing is that systematic reviews is both referring to the methods used, but it is also a specific type. And so what I mean by that is we have scoping reviews, we have systematic reviews, and we also have meta-analysis. And then within each of these, of course, there's, there's more that drop down out of there. But since it's just an introduction, we're just gonna focus on these for now. And uh, I do also have the DOI of a recommended paper here. This is a very classic paper by Grant and Booth. I do recommend that you take the time to read through that if you're interested in the various types of reviews that exist. All right, so why do we want to actually do a systematic review? So if you're a graduate student, there are tons of reasons why systematic reviews are really helpful and they're why I recommend uh, graduate students really spend time learning the method and actually conducting a systematic review in their field. So first and foremost, it's going to help you build a really deep understanding of your future content area. And the reason is because you're going to end up reading the abstract of every single paper in your area that meets your search terms. Second, you'll be able to identify some of the major scholars in your field. So think about when you're going into something new, maybe you're in this situation right now, where you're a brand new graduate student and your advisor says, hey, what kind of thing do you want to study in graduate school? And you say, oh, you know, come up with some vague thing. Like I remember for me, it was video games. It's like, I want to study video games. And it's like, that's, that's super broad, right? So when I narrowed it down to what aspects am I interested in video games, I ended up studying virtual characters. Well, one of the first things that we end up doing is trying to identify who are the people who publish about virtual characters a lot so that we can, you know, start reading about the things that are interesting to other people in the field. Systematic reviews can help you do that. They can also be very, very useful for identifying gaps that you find in the literature. So we'll talk more about this as we talk about actually analyzing data, but know that in my opinion, this is one of the most important things for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. It's not, I don't find so much the findings interesting. I do think the findings are interesting, but I think highlighting where more research is needed is where we really see some of the value come out of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Next, we can also identify what areas are saturated with findings. So if you are completing your graduate work, you probably wanna make sure that whatever work you're doing actually has some contribution to science, right? You wanna make sure that what you're doing adds to the literature. By doing a systematic review, you'll be able to identify what areas already have tons of research around them and really help you identify the gap that you want to address with your research. We're also going to start building an in-depth understanding of why your area of work is important and what future research is needed. So this may seem kind of obvious, but by reading all of these different abstracts and then reading a bunch of specific papers in the full text form, you're going to really start developing an in-depth understanding of what your area is, what motivates your area, the major theories in the area, et cetera. So one of the questions that I get asked a lot by graduate students is they'll ask me a question and I'll just know the reference off the top of my head. Part of that is I just have a weird memory that lets me do that. But part of that is also from having done so many systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So uh, I see a lot of people ask professors in particular, how do you remember that? How do you how do you just pick out that paper out of your mind? How do you know which paper to send me to when I, when I mentioned some vague finding like found virtual characters did this. How do you do that? Well, the reason is because we've read those papers, right? And we've cited those papers. You can start to help develop that memory by doing a systematic review in this area because you're going to end up actually reading the abstracts of every study that you locate, right? And so by reading those abstracts, you're going to get a base level understanding of what is happening in the field. So if somebody asks you the question of like, hey, have people done any, done any research around, for example, virtual characters and confusion? You'll think back to your memory and you'll say, hmm, did I read any abstracts like that? Yes or no? And then you can caveat that by 
you know, in your mind, you're thinking, okay, this is what my search terms were. Would I have actually located that? Long story short, this is one of the best strategies I feel for really developing the memory that scholars are often known for, which is really a matter of understanding what's happening in the broader field. Uh, if you are early in your career, one of the things that I know a lot of students really enjoy is when their papers get cited. The fact of the matter is reviews often get cited. I'm not saying they necessarily get cited more or less than empirical work, but a lot of times reviews get cited. If you think about your own writing process, you often probably find reviews to help support your writing, when, especially when you're writing literature reviews. Also, as we go through the systematic review process, we may find that we actually need to contact scholars in the field. So particularly when we're conducting meta-analyses, we often may find papers that just don't have enough data, but they almost have enough data for us to be able to include them in the analysis. So a lot of times we'll end up actually emailing somebody and say, asking for that data. Similar process might happen with systematic reviews. Perhaps you need some clarification and it gives you a reason to reach out to people you may otherwise not have a reason to reach out to. All right, so what if you're a practicing researcher and you're just starting to get into systematic reviews and meta-analyses? Why might this be helpful to you? Well, a lot of the reasons are the same, but put in a little bit different perspective, if you are a practicing researcher, you know that you need to identify research gaps. Systematic reviews can help you do that. They can also help you identify what is working and what isn't working in the field. You'll be able to see what things uh, start to have an impact and which interventions don't necessarily have an impact in whatever field that you are researching can also help you become known in a new field of inquiry. And I mentioned this because I found that a lot of times when you publish a systematic review or a meta-analysis, those papers end up getting cited by people working on similar work in the field. It's not a guarantee, obviously, but it's just a pattern that I've seen. Uh, next, it can help you develop a deep understanding of the field. So as a practicing researcher, you've probably tried to enter a new field at some point in your career, having not conducted a systematic review. And at least my experience has been that leads to a lot of reading. And no matter how much reading I do, I never really feel I truly deeply understand the field until I've spent a huge amount of time reading in that area. Well, one of the things that I like about systematic reviews is that you end up reading all of these abstracts in your specific area, and then you narrow that down further based on inclusion criteria. So you can develop a really deep understanding of the field that you are actually researching because you're gonna read all those abstracts and you're gonna read all the relevant full text as part of this process. Next, one of the things I really enjoy is that there's little reliance on others, right? The work basically gets done as quickly as you complete it. So you don't have to wait for somebody else. You don't have to wait for you know permissions or a certain time of the year to be able to collect the data. You can just do this work as quickly as you are able to complete it. You also don't need to recruit research participants. So if you're a practicing researcher, you've probably experienced this struggle at some point of like, hey, I have this really cool study that I wanna run, but I need like 300 people to participate. And I definitely don't have 300 willing research participants right now. So recruiting research participants can take a lot of time and energy. One of the other things that's a little bit redundant here is there's no more hoping you've read enough. So I don't know about you guys, but I've often uh, met people who are like, I read this, I wrote this paper, we did this study, but man, as I'm writing the discussion, I'm finding new things that I didn't necessarily know exist. And I'm just really hoping I read enough in the area to be able to know that this is really the contribution I'm thinking it is. Well, that's why I like systematic reviews is because they give me an opportunity to develop a really deep understanding of the field. So I don't feel this same hope because I feel much more confident in myself. Next, one of the really important things in education, I can't speak more broadly about other fields, is having a really strong theoretical framework in our studies. So when we're conducting systematic reviews, one of the things we might be doing is trying to identify what theoretical frameworks are driving work in this field. And even if this isn't something you are intentionally trying to find, it will come up, right? Because you might end up with 40 or 50 studies included, and those 40 or 50 studies are likely going to have some theoretical framework that they're referencing. All right, so let's take a really, really brief look at non-systematic reviews in that side of this table. So there's many different types. Uh, the, the most common type that I've seen are narrative reviews. Uh, these are reviews that don't really have a method section. They're just reviewing what's there. You might also see something called a critical review. These oftentimes do not have a method section. You might also see something called an overview, which again would not necessarily have a method section. Sometimes we just see papers called reviews. So what do these things have in common? Well, as you heard me say with these other, other four review types, they don't have systematic methods. And as such, it makes them 
pretty much impossible to replicate. Anything that cannot be replicated is what I would classify as a non-systematic review. They are not my preference to conduct anymore. I find them more challenging to get published, and I also find them to not necessarily have a um, set inclusion criteria, which makes them more susceptible to bias, in my personal opinion. Okay, so now let's check out the other side of this taxonomy here with systematic reviews. And we're just gonna go through a couple different types that are common in education really quickly. This is a super high level overview. Know that there are methods pieces specifically dedicated to how to conduct these different types of reviews, but this is just a super surface level overview. So let's talk about scoping reviews first. Well, what is the purpose of a scoping review? In education, we don't see these called scoping reviews too often yet, but in other fields, scoping reviews are quite pre prevalent, and we are seeing them occur more and more in education. So what are they for? Scoping reviews are for exploring the nature and scope of a field. So we're basically trying to understand what exists, right? So we're trying to identify where research synthesis and experimentation are needed. Now, a lot of times you might find, you might read something called a systematic review, but they don't necessarily analyze the data too much, right? It's really descriptive. It could be that that's actually a scoping review and just labeled a systematic review. But the main thing I think about with scoping reviews is that they're primarily descriptive rather than analytical. I feel that systematic reviews as a method is more analytical, whereas scoping reviews are more descriptive and just trying to tell us the nature and scope of the field. So publishing these can sometimes be challenging, but that may also just be that they're relatively new in education. Uh, just in casual conversations with some of my colleagues, some people have mentioned that they feel these are kind of surface level. And from feedback I've gotten on from reviewers around uh, some of these scoping reviews, that's similar to the types of feedback that I've received. Now, the position I've taken with this is it is somewhat surface level, but it is still informative, right? And why is it informative? We all go back to two things. One, we're trying to understand the nature and scope of the field, and presumably you have a very good reason to do so, and so you need to make that clear in your paper. Second, we're trying to identify where research synthesis is needed and where experimentation could take place. Right? Those are two very important implications for a field, and it's up to you as a reviewer to help demonstrate that need in your writing. All right, so now let's talk about systematic reviews as a specific type of method rather than an umbrella term. So these are generally aimed at synthesizing the state of the literature. So where I see these in education, particularly educational technology, which is the area that I work in the most, we often see these aimed at a particular intervention, and we're trying to understand either how well it works or how to design something. So we might be looking at, for example, how well a virtual character uh, helps support learning compared to systems without a virtual character. That could also be a meta-analysis question. Or we might be looking at how to design virtual characters to be more effective for supporting learning. So these can also be aimed around methods and trying to understand how methods are applied in specific ways within the field, or they can be aimed, uh, aimed around theoretical frameworks. We can try and understand how different theories have guided different extant work. So basically what I'm saying here is there's a lot of different ways that we can actually use systematic reviews. Now, the key differentiator in my mind between a systematic review and a scoping review is that systematic reviews are both descriptive and analytical, but the main emphasis of the researcher is synthesizing the field, okay? I don't wanna read something called a systematic review that just tells me what I could have deducted on my own, right? That kind of defeats the purpose. What we wanna see is synthesis. We wanna know, okay, you've collected these 40 studies. What do they mean together, right? It, like, what, what do you actually know now from reading 40 studies that we didn't know before that we wouldn't necessarily know from reading 20 of those 40 studies? So being able to actually find themes and synthesize the data from your data set is really what systematic reviews are about. So we really want to make sure that we are developing a deep understanding of the phenomenon of interest. That's really the purpose here. And a lot of times I get asked the question, um, are systematic reviews quantitative or qualitative? And my argument has always been, they're generally qualitative, but have some sort of descriptive quantitative statistics. So what do I mean by this? We might say something like 60% of the studies in our sample found, and then we'll talk about the themes of, of what was found there. All right, last but not least, meta-analysis. Let's talk about what this is. 
Meta-analysis conceptually is a quantitative synthesis of the quantitative literature within the field. So sometimes you'll see this term misused, right? Meta-analysis is a specific method. There are many different types of meta-analysis, but sometimes you'll see papers called a meta-analysis that are actually not quantitative. They're actually a systematic review. So when we are talking about meta-analysis, we are talking specifically about quantitative synthesis. Generally speaking, the field of education, educational technology that I work in, we generally are looking at meta-analyses for understanding the impact of an intervention or the relationships between two variables. So what I mean by that is that we are looking at how well something works, so virtual character compared to other uh, learning interventions, or the relationships between two things, such as the motivation between, let's say, self-efficacy and learning. Now there's a lot of different types of meta-analysis. So we have conventional meta-analysis, three-level meta-analysis. There's a bunch of different variants that you can do within three-level meta-analysis. Uh, you might see structural equation modeling meta-analysis. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of really, really cool methods, but we only have two that are really common in education right now. One is conventional meta-analysis. This is one outcome per participant. We're gonna come back to why this is important in the future. And we also have three level meta-analysis. And this is interesting because it can actually account for dependencies within the data. So again, we're gonna come back to this idea of conventional versus three level in a later video, but I want you to know for now that they exist and they're different. Okay, so one last type of review that we see a little bit in education, we see it more in other fields, but I feel it's coming into the educational field. And this is umbrella reviews. So what these are, are they are a systematic review of systematic reviews. Kind of interesting, right? So with a systematic review, we're often, I, I say often, not always, but we are generally speaking looking at primary studies. Whereas with an umbrella review, we are conducting a systematic review of systematic reviews. So really kind of fun. Uh, they aim to build a synthesized understanding of the field and identify common gaps and challenges that we saw between all of these systematic reviews. All right, so that pretty much wraps up our video here. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Thank you.